Tell me, my dear friends, what would convince you to sell your soul? What could possibly be of such immense value that you would give up the very essence of your being? Quite a question, isn't it? And one that's posed in tonight's story. Another fantastic effort from Dr. Creepensvolt, the subreddit and I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all to you. And a real treat I've got in store for you this evening, I can tell you. Well, my dear friends, it's Friday evening, we've made it through another long week, and I think you all deserve to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. Adrian Bourne was a desperate man. At 43, newly divorced, he'd also lost most of his family. That would have been bad enough, but... What really hurt the most was the manner in which he'd lost them. He'd lost them to the supernatural. Yes, that supernatural. Full of things that go bump in the night and hide in your closet or under your bed. But these things don't hide because they're afraid of humans. They hide because they don't want humans to get used to them. They want to savor the fear they cause when they pounce and tear their victims apart. They want their human prey to grow fat happy and oblivious, and because darkness is what they are made of. His mother was snatched from right in front of him one peaceful night when they met up at her house to catch up. Even more cruelly, they'd met up to reminisce about their shared grief over Adrian's father's death a year past. He'd been found torn to shreds near a hiking trail he favoured, his skull crushed and his brain entirely missing. All major bones in his body had been found snapped and drained of marrow. They thought it was a bear or a wolf, except Adrian knew that the claw and teeth marks on his father's bones were too large to be either a bear or a wolf. Both of them were sitting on a couch watching TV, laughing at the same things and criticizing the same unrealistic parts as they'd always done. And then the thing struck. A shadow made solid, it literally emerged out of a shadowy corner of the room, a thing of darkness and claws. It dug its many blade-like fingers into his mother's back, and then a maw of pure blackness closed in around her head, and Adrian heard a sickening crunch. It was the last he saw of his mother, as the thing retreated into the shadow from whence it came, dragging her along with it. Months of police investigation and suspicion on him ruined his career and the memory of that sight burned in his mind and haunted his sleepless nights. Even stranger, months into the investigation, a pair of men in black suits showed up while the police were interviewing Adrian for what felt like the hundredth time. The men talked to the superintendent in charge. She had a quiet word with the investigative officers and they abruptly ended the interview and informed Adrian that the case was closed, and that he was free to go. Nothing Adrian tried would get the police to reopen the case. Therapy helped. His best friend supported him, and his sister comforted him as best she knew how, but it wasn't something he ever thought he'd learn to accept. He began researching unexplained sightings and incidents, dealing with mysterious attacks and disappearances, hoping to find some clue, some answer as to what the hell had taken both his parents. He took a job as a night guard at a museum, so he could have more time to pore over the internet. Most of it was garbage, fakes and bullshit. But Adrian persisted. His best friend and his sister, Adria, worried about his obsession, which had now stretched to obscure rituals of summoning, rites to commune with beings from outside our reality, of demons and of devils. But they did not abandon him. They too spent their free time helping Adrian in his quest for answers. And find something they did. Not some post on a conspiracy site or bullshit supernatural forums on Reddit, but a brief article in National Geographic's archives from ten years back. It had been a tremendous day for archaeology that day the day Genghis Khan's tomb had finally been found. News had made the rounds around the globe, the names of the people who discovered it forever etched into history. What Adrian and his friends found wasn't that. 
It was an auxiliary publication to that momentous discovery, mentioning something about a bronze tablet found in the tomb with both Latin and Mongolian vertical script on it. It was dated to the early years of the Great Khan's life, after Timujin disappeared from most records and before Genghis Khan appeared to shake the world with his conquests. The tablet being written in a European language and the same text translated into Mongolian before the Khan's conquest opened the way from west to east and knowledge began to flow across Asia and Europe was weird enough, but the text spoke of a ritual to contact an outer god. That in itself wouldn't be unusual. Most such writings in Europe would have been burned by the church and their possessors probably removed or burned as heretics and devil worshippers. But this text was meticulously and carefully carved, and the tablet covered in a layer of gold. This would ensure it would survive the elements and being buried for millions of years. Someone spent a great deal of care and effort to make sure the message survived, and the great Khan had it buried with his body. The friends decided to have a closer look at the text and try to translate it. With the resources of the internet at their disposal, it didn't take long to translate the Latin section. It detailed a ritual that would bring them into contact with an entity that would grant the summoner a very specific wish. Anything you've already seen, heard and experienced will be yours to bring forth to reality. Sixty years of life will be granted to you, free of disease and suffering. On the sixty-first year's first day, we will claim your soul. Well, the friends thought, a soul for a wish type trait. <laughs> no, thank you, they thought, and forgot about the ritual. Until, in short succession, after running the text through Google Translate, men in black military garb thrust in on Adrian and his sister as he was having a sleepover with her and her wife. They promptly began shouting orders to get down on the ground, while pointing assault rifles at them. They would have all been taken to God only knows what fate, if it wasn't for a twist of cruel irony. The thing from the shadows struck again. It tore two of the men apart in seconds, slicing through their body armor like a sword through paper. Adrian, Adria, and her wife took the opportunity to run, but another apparition manifested outside. What could only be described as an enormous wolf made of shadow with two glowing, flaming green eyes lunged out of the darkness and snapped Adria's wife in two at the midsection with one bite. Adria screamed in horror, but Adrian dragged her along with him into the little wood near their house. They flagged down a driver passing by, and Adrian made up some story about having just escaped an armed home invasion, which wasn't too far from the truth. They drove to a motel. Miraculously, Adrian had had his phone on him. A tough builder's phone. It had survived being slammed into the ground, and Adrian used it to pay for a couple of rooms. He couldn't stay there for long, though. Whoever those jack-booted thugs were, they could probably track the online purchase of the rooms and come looking for them again. The next day, the siblings went to the bank and withdrew all the money they had, then drove out of the country into their birth country in the middle of Europe. For a few weeks, all seemed fine. <laughs> They'd gotten away. And then, one day they read a news story online, saying that their best friend had died mysteriously in a car crash. Their hearts sank. Neither of them had any illusions that their friend's death had been an accident. The archived article on Nat Geo that had preceded all of this had been removed as well. The only copy that remained was on Adrian's phone. They tried to forget about all of this and didn't pursue any more research. They tried to forget about it and just live life again. But it was not to be. They took to keeping their house permanently well illuminated, sleeping with blinds on their eyes. They wouldn't go out at night, but it wasn't enough. One night the power went out in their mountain cabin. Adria quickly snatched up a flashlight and shot it out the windows, while Adrian went to check the fuses. What she saw froze her blood. A thing of a shadow, its outline similar to an oversized demonic bat perching on the power line pole that fed to their house. 
It had bitten the pole and its cables in half and was chewing on one of the halves. When it saw her, the creature lunged at her, breaking through the thick oak walls like they were paper. A scream of impossible terror was the last thing Adrian heard from his sister, and he rushed towards the noise the creature had made, busting through their wall. He froze, sure he was next. But the creature just grinned a massive, impossibly wide grin filled with razor-sharp, painfully white fangs, still dripping with his sister's blood. It spoke. It sounded like a rumble from a collapsing mountain. You're next. Sue. And with that, it flew off. This loss nearly broke Adrian. Everything and everyone had been taken from him. He had nothing left. His parents, his sister, his best and only friend... Even his dog had one day vanished near a lake they liked to walk by, dragged in by some kind of tentacle beast. He was alone in the world, and all he had left were the last dregs of his saving, and that ritual saved on his phone. <sighs> to hell with it, Adrian thought. Those things have already ripped out my soul piece by piece. He used the last of his money to get the supplies he needed. This wasn't candles and sacrifice ritual, no. He needed to inhale the smoke from several herbs and substances and enter a trance. He did his preparations, lit the bowl with the required materials, and breathed in deep. This was either going to work or kill him, and he was past caring. It worked. His vision darkened, then lit up with sickly, unnatural green light and he saw a blood-freezing sight of a many-mouthed, many-tentacled abomination that seemed simultaneously close and small, but also very far away and impossibly large. It spoke. Initially, the sound almost killed him with a shock of fear, but gradually it modulated down to a merely terrifying human voice. Do you take the deal? Sixty years, and anything I've seen, heard, and experienced made real on my will? He managed to ask, mostly without stuttering. Anything you have heard, seen, and experienced on your flea-bag little world, you can bring to reality as many times as you want. Yes, even your dead ones, the creature answered, as if reading his mind. Do you take the deal? Last chance. Adrian hesitated for a moment, but then spoke. Yes, I take the deal. And with that, it was done. Sixty years passed. It was a blink of an eye for the outer god, nothing at all. And time came to collect the debt. It sent its emissary. It would materialize in our world near the location of the soul debtor, and no barrier in existence would bar its path to the one it had come to collect. The emissary appeared. He would not have known this, but the world in which Adrian had made his deal was early 21st century Earth, same as you see now when you look out of your window. The world in which the emissary appeared was different. It appeared on a massive, mile-wide boulevard, a boulevard suspended between two titanic spires, miles high into the Earth's atmosphere. Around him were many such spires, titanic cathedrals in the clouds, built as if of white marble and gold. Between them stretched massive, elevated highways, and lines of orderly ships and craft flew between them. Above, in low orbit... The shapes of titanic spacecraft occasionally blotted out the light of the sun. Around the flying craft flew patrols of humanoid figures, clad in ornate golden armor and with white wings on their backs. Here and there, dragons flew as well, some small, some larger than any 21st century aircraft, and of all shades and colors. The emissary didn't know that it had not been like this 60 years ago. This world meant nothing to it. He could not admire the spectacular changes this world had undergone in a mere half-century. It 
merely wanted a specific soul. That soul was ahead of him in the most massive of the spires. It walked toward it. It came to a massive door guarded by two golden armored winged figures. They stared at him and didn't move. This puzzled the emissary, as usually its presence caused unspeakable terror in these puny mortal creatures. But these two didn't even flinch. I come for the soul of Adrian Ball, it declared. The two figures looked at each other and then spoke as one in a voice reminiscent of Rolling Thunder. <laughs> the Emperor expects you. And with that, the massive doors opened. The emissary homed in on the soul it had come for, and this brought him to a titanic hall. A gallery half a mile wide and a quarter tall resplendent gold, white and blue statues as tall as the hall lined the walls. Trees of translucent blue, vivid green and pale red, grew in pools of glowing blue water. A vast colonnade pointed the way towards the soul it had come for. As the emissary approached, it saw four beings sitting on the white and red marble floor. Four dragons, massive in size, towering even over the emissary. They pulsed with power. One red one, with horns decorated with rings, overflowed with life. It was almost like something had taken an entire forest with all its creatures and reshaped it into a dragon. The scent of overpowering vitality sickened the emissary. It turned its six spider-like eyes to the blue dragon. Magic poured from this one. Immense potential to change anything into anything else at will. Next to that one, was a bronze drake around which time shimmered and shattered, and then reformed. The last dragon was green and seemed to be asleep, but the emissary felt it watching him from a waking dream the dragon had dreamt. Powerful beings, aspects of existence. The emissary thought they might oppose it in its mission, but felt no worry. It was the extension of its master's will, the will of an elder god as the sickening living creatures would call it. The emissary approached what looked like a throne on a massive platform. On it sat its target. Leaning against the throne and the two columns behind it were four figures. Larger than a man, one was massive indeed, clad in black and silver armor with a red hood and an artificial arm. A silver cauldron was on its right shoulder, and a golden one on his right. It had a huge sword, the blade as wide as its guard. Another was naked from the waist up, except for its armoured hands and had two sickles at its waist. Its face was covered by a polished bone mask. The third was a woman, fierce and beautiful, if the emissary could process such things in its alien mind. Her purple hair stood up in a wild mess, and her body was covered in a dark grey figure-hugging armour, and at her hip she had a nasty-looking barbed whip. The final figure also had its head and face covered by a silver helmet. It had a purple scarf around its neck, and was busy twirling a massive revolver. All four looked at the emissary with flat expressions. Its aura of terror seemed to bother them not at all. In front of the throne sat two massive wolves, grey and as big as an elephant. On the back of the throne to the left sat two ravens, and on the right sat an owl, constantly eyeing the ravens suspiciously. But they were of no concern to the emissary, not unless they tried to stop it from completing its mission. The figure on the throne was its objective. If it had any notion of such things, the emissary might have been surprised that... Instead of an old man past his centennial, Adrian looked vital and young. He too was clad in armour, bleached bone, like a carapace. Upon his back were a pair of mechanical wings built into the armour. Its helmet was shaped like the head of a jackal. Upon its breast was carved a scarab, and below it an unk. His left eye was missing, and in its place was a glowing blue gem. 
Around his eyes were tattoos that a human versed in ancient Egyptian history would have known as a symbol of Amun-Ra. His left armor gauntlet was larger than his right and had six stones placed into it. One blue, one red, one yellow, one green, one purple, and one orange. Five were placed at the gauntlet's knuckles and one on the back of his palm. In his right arm, Adrian held a weapon, half axe, half hammer. Its shaft was a metal rod, with what seemed to be vines growing along it, and holding the hammer half and the axe half together. The axe half crackled with lightning, while the hammer half glowed with mysterious power. Upon Adrian's back was a scythe, with a shaft made of skulls joined end to end. It emanated death. It reeked of it to the emissary. This sensation he liked. None of the other creatures made a move to impede the emissary, and it approached its quarry. Come on up, said Adrian amiably. Don't mind Freki and Gary, he said, pointing at the wolves. Don't worry about the horsemen or the dragons either. They won't bother you, he added pointing first at the figures relaxing against his throne, then at the four dragons lounging on the immense floor. Even at their size, they barely took up any room in the massive throne room. Give us your soul, the emissary boomed. A mere man would have died on the spot. No ifs, no buts, just dead. Then the emissary would have devoured his or her soul, sending it screaming to its master and creator. But Adrian just stood there, impassively, and very much not dead. The emissary stared for a moment, uncomprehending. It had collected thousands of souls before, from those who took its master's deal. They would try to hide, to run, to fight. Some threw armies against it, some hid in fortresses or caves or bunkers. The emissary slaughtered their armies, broke open their hiding places like so many eggshells, and they all died screaming. Not stone, nor steel, nor fire, nor flesh could stop it. Its master willed it. Some even tried to use their wish to keep summoning more and more defenders to stop the emissary. But once their time was up, their wish was over. Many had thought to use the power of the wish to summon something to defeat the emissary, but they couldn't, for they could only call on what they could see with their own eyes, hear with their own ears, and thus experience. Those who took the deal could call for sensations they had once felt, and make them real. They could summon endless servants, endless money, endless food, as long as they had seen, held in their hands, or heard and tasted it. Genghis Khan himself made some use of the wish in the period of time when he all but dropped out of the historical record. He used it to kickstart his rise to power. But nothing that was within reach of humans could withstand the emissary. Nothing that walked this earth could. And yet, Adrian stood. He stared at the emissary for a moment and spoke. Um, no. Those two words. A refusal. Many had screamed no, but none had said it so calmly. The emissary did not speak. It had the power to take the soul its master wanted. It extended its grotesque, massive right upper arm, one of four it had on its bestial torso, and a tentacle of sick green light sprang out and into Adrian's chest. It started to pull out a translucent blue silhouette. But it was not the small outline of a human soul. No, it was big. Extremely big. As the emissary backed away and kept pulling, the outline began to become clear. It was a freaking dragon again. Immense. As the emissary kept pulling, the blue ghost filled the cavernous throne room to the top dwarfing the physical dragon still sitting impassively on the floor. Then, with half of that incredible soul out, the emissary was stopped. Adrian had sat there motionless as his soul was extracted, 
Then the soul lunged its immense right, ghostly forelimb, and the clawed, reptilian hand passed right through the emissary and came out with a ball of translucent, sickly black and glowing green slime, covered in fanged mouths and flailing tentacles. It was screeching and writhing, but the dragon soul kept it firmly grasped in its ethereal claw. The emissary was still conscious, though. Its two mouths, one on top of the other, were open in agonized rictus. Adrian stepped down from his throne. He hefted his hammer axe in one hand and swung the hammer end at the paralyzed emissary with a massive crack of lightning. It flew clear across the throne room and smashed into the crystalline entrance gate with enough force to crack them. Adrian then flew across the room in a flash and a gust of air. He grasped the emissary's bulging neck with his right hand, hefting its massive body up as he extended his wings and took off, hovering just high enough to dangle the sickening creature off the floor. Not possible, the emissary croaked out of both its mouths. Is it not? asked Adrian, his tone even. I quote, Anything I hear, see and experience. That was your master's deal. That is what I was granted. Adrian brought the creature's eyes to stare into his. The emissary looked on in disbelief. He saw a divine flame inside Adrian. He spat a glob of glowing green acid. It impacted a shimmering field in front of Adrian's face and slid to the floor where it proceeded to eat away at the pristine material. Puny, godly, you think this will save you? It howled a voice to turn blood to ice. Oh, I'm not a god, said Adrian. And suddenly, his appearance changed. His mouth opened in a horrific fanged grin to mirror the emissary's own. His human eye burned with white hellfire, and from his mouth red flame sprang as he spoke in a voice that was like many rumbling voices speaking as one. I... I'm not one god, you jackass. I am many. I am Odin. I am Amunra. I am Thor, Athena, Horus, Toth, and Anubis. I am a walking pantheon. Adrian's voice is howled into the emissary's face as the extent of its supposed victim's power was slowly revealed. But Adrian did not stop. Above his demonic-looking face, a burning angelic halo of pure light appeared around his head. I am the son of the high heavens. I am the spawn of the burning hells. I am soul of the dragon, and I am the master of mankind. The emissary's body began to do something unthinkable. It began to tremble. With the titanic dragon soul holding its extra planar existence in its cruel claw, it could not even lift its arm to attack. It felt the unthinkable. It felt fear. No, not fear. Terror. Terror for its own existence. In the grasp of this impossible being whose soul it had come to collect, it shuddered uncontrollably and croaked. <laughs> How? Adrian grinned that feral, unbelievably wide grin as the angelic halo on his head burned brighter. <laughs> Your boss really should have paid more attention to this. Uh, how did he describe it? Little fleabag planet. And to how he words his contracts. Anything I see, hear and experience? <laughs> Welcome to some of my favorite films and games, asshole. I made mankind's fantasies a reality with your boss's power. Adrian's grin reached its widest yet. Adrian lifted his left hand, the one with the gauntlet bearing six glowing gems, and spoke again. <laughs> Tell your boss and the rest of the trash hanging out there beyond our reality... They are banned from this universe and all that will come after. Forever. And with that, 
He snapped his left hand fingers. A massive surge of power slammed up his arm that made even him wince. And a few seconds later, the emissary's grotesque form began disintegrating into a cloud of ash. Adrian's dragon soul finally released the emissary's ethereal presence, and it was sucked back through an invisible portal to whatever non-place it was spawned from. Turning back to the four figures still watching with vaguely amused expressions from around his throne, he spoke. Come now, lads. We've got great old ones and shit still to cleanse. Oh, and a universe to bring life to. So another weird and wonderful tale for your Friday evening delight there. Hope you enjoyed that one. I thought that was very, very interesting. Very interesting take indeed on the whole god genre and what you would do if you sold your soul. Stupid immortal creatures, eh? Don't mess with us humans. We're much cleverer than you think. <laughs> well, we like to think so, don't we? Well, that's it for another week. And of course, I will be back again with you on Monday. You're going to join me, aren't you? Say you will. Go on. Go on, go on, go on. <laughs> okay, see you all again real soon then. But until then, sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>